الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام م صاد كتاب أنزل إليك فلا يكون في صدرك حرج منه لتنذر به وذكر للمؤمنين اتبعوا ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم ولا تتبعوا من دونه أولياء قليلا ما تذكرون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل نقطة من لساني يفقه قولي <coughs> ثم أما بعد It's been quite some time since I've been back at Dar al-Islah. MashaAllah, it's good to be here. Alhamdulillah. Um, first announcement I want to make is I am totally fine with children out there, but if you have a psychotic child, take a walk before the aunties start giving you the look of death. And you, you know they already have, so just save yourself the trouble and just take a walk, you know, go in the back, do the Pakistani thing, smack your child, I don't know. <coughs> don't do that, I was just kidding. Brother Numan said it. Like, <laughs> don't do that. But um, yeah, so if your kids are normal, which probably they're not, um, <laughs> just stay close to them, stay in their vicinity, and don't let them be by each, by each other's side. That is dangerous. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to take a different approach in this talk. I have about an hour or so in this talk, and I'm intimidated whether or not I can finish what I want to share with you within, within the hour. Um, <laughs> But I want to take an approach that I've been recently, more recently, more interested in taking with my students in Dallas. And I want to share that approach with you. I've obviously, the, the talk, the title of the talk is, talk is generic enough, Attaining Jannah, that you could just talk about making wudu properly under that title, and that would still be Attaining Jannah. But I'm going to share with you uh, actually something very pertinent to that topic. But I'm going to use the Qur'an and its arguments themselves in organization of the ayat themselves from Surah Al-A'raf to go through a lesson that Allah Azza wa Jal teaches. And the reason I'll do that, usually if, you've, if you're used to my talks, I take one or two ayat and I build an entire khutbah or talk around them. But as opposed to that, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to go probably try to finish two or three pages of Surah Al-A'raf in a flowing argument and try to connect these ayat together so we understand how Allah Azza wa Jal Himself builds an argument and how He teaches lessons and He mentally prepares you one thing over the next how steps are built inside the Qur'an itself and this particularly I find a very this, the reason I picked this passage in particular is because it has a lot to do with Jannah it has a lot to do with what I call going back home because humanity's starting point is Jannah then we left Jannah and now we have to go back find our way back home Right? So this, this passage has a lot to do with that. And it actually has to, a lot to do with the big reason for which we were expelled in the first place. It explores that rationale, that reason. Why was humanity expelled out of Jannah to begin with? What was that mistake? And how did that happen? It's discussed in more detail here in this surah than anywhere else in the Qur'an. So in order to make our way back home, we need to make sure not to make that mistake that was once historically made, that Allah made, paid so much attention to in this surah. This is a Makki surah, which means it was revealed before the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the city of to the Migration to the city of Medina It's a late Makki surah, which means the tone of it is very aggressive What that means is Allah is increasingly warning the Quraysh more and more Early Madani surahs, Allah gives, you know, He reminds them of His favors Right? And He will, he will expect them to become grateful But He won't threaten them as much Even though He'll threaten them a little, not as much Later Makkan surahs, he gets tougher and tougher and tougher. And this is one of those tough surahs. So like Shah Waliullah Dahibi rahimahullah said about this surah, it has ayamullah in it, the days of Allah, the days in which he destroyed nations, the days in which he reckoned. The day of judgment is described in great detail, for instance. So let's begin. Alif Lam Mim Saad. Kitabun Unzila Ilaik. A magnificent book has been revealed to you, that's been sent down to you. Falayakun fi sadrika haraj minhu. Are you doing that? Or am I doing that? Okay. I thought that was my stomach. Okay. It's for his friend. Huh? No, no. Okay. Not for you. So, okay. I'm just trying to help you. Okay. okay. Should I st I'll stop. Because what you're yeah. doing is way too interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Sir. Okay. <laughs> All right. Can I go on? Yeah. Okay. Is that better? That is better somewhat. Okay. فَلَا يَكُنْ فِي صَدْرِكَ حَرَجْ Then there should be no... <laughs> okay. 
Okay. If I speak louder, then okay. This is better. Inshallah ta'ala. Okay. فَلَا يَكُنْ فِي صَدْرِكَ حَرَجْ So there should be no discomfort in your chest. The Messenger والسلام, an amazing book has been given to him. But the more he delivers the message of this book, the more people start hating him. And the more they start making fun of the Quran. And that makes him very uncomfortable. Obviously nobody likes to be made fun of. Nobody likes to be insulted. And the aggression by the Quraysh is getting worse and worse and worse. So Allah says there's nothing wrong with the book that's been sent to you. And you shouldn't feel any discomfort because of it. The only purpose you've been given this book is now at this point to warn by means of it. You know other places in the Quran Allah tells His Messenger والسلام, Bashiran wa nadiran. He's come to give good news and He's come to give warning. You've heard that before? He's come to do two things, to give people good news of, what obviously, Jannah, and the warning of hellfire. But look, the beginning of the surah didn't even mention good news. He just said, Allah straight said, a magnificent book has come to you so that you may warn. Now when you're talking to people that have potential of good in them more, you give them good news. When you're talking to tough students, like teachers in the audience here, when you're talking to troubled students, you give them good news or warnings more. Warnings. The good student, you say, hey, I have an extra credit assignment for you, if you can answer this question, if you can finish these three problems. The troubled student, you say, you want to go to the principal's office? <laughs> Sit on your chair. He warns. So this is obviously, he's not dealing with the easy crowd, he's dealing with the tough crowd now. And it will serve as a strong war, uh, uh, memory, a reminder for those who truly believe. In other words, even for the mu'mineen, Allah did not say, Bushra lil mu'mineen. He didn't, he says, a reminder. So when he, is, when he is terrifying the disbeliever of hellfire, it'll serve as a strong reminder for the believer. The believer should never feel like these reminders that are in Mecca and Quran, d dedicated to the Quraysh who obviously disbelieved, the scum of Mecca, these warnings that are coming to them, it's about them, it's not about me. Allah says, no, bel believers should listen carefully too. And it'll serve as a very strong reminder for them. SubhanAllah. So we never look at these ayat and say, ah oh, man, those Quraysh were such losers. Because it's always supposed to be about us from the very beginning. Allah did not let us become kind of passive as we listen. It's not just a history lesson anymore. ذِكْرَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ اتَّبِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Follow whatever has been sent down to you from your master. Now two audiences have been mentioned. A nation that has to be warned, and a nation that will benefit from the reminder. And to both of them Allah says, follow whatever Allah has revealed to you from your master. So the call of this surah is to obey revelation. You'll, I'm going to ask you to remember that. The, the thesis of this surah, the book has come not to cause you difficulty. It, doesn't call, it, doesn't, it hasn't come to make you, your life uncomfortable. And you have to follow it. Qalila. And then he says, awliya. Don't follow any other protective friends. Don't find any other guardians other than him. Qalila ma tadhakkaroon. How little an effort you make to remember. Now he's complaining to both. Believers and disbelievers and saying, look, you need to put some work in. How little you like to remember. And now remember what? You know, memory by definition of, of something that happened in the past. Yes? And there are levels of memory. Uh, this is a very deep concept. Some of them I have talked about under this ayah. I'll try to give you the, the brief version of it. You know, how, little, how much do we remember of when we were in Allah's company and He took a covenant from us? Am I not your master? It's mentioned in the Quran, in this surah actually. أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا We don't remember. قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكُرُ How little you remember? Allah remembers what happened. Allah reminds us. We don't even remember. When, how do we remember when the angel delivered our soul, our ruh, into the belly of our mother? We were being delivered. We traveled the skies and came into the womb of our mother. How do we? We don't remember. We don't remember. We were inside the belly of our mother and we were being fed. We were taken care of. We don't remember. We don't remember a lot. How much we've been taken care of. So now Allah Azza wa is making a demand also based on the original promise. The original promise was, you said that you've accepted me as my master, as your master. Why wouldn't you follow me? Have you forgotten how little you remember? But also, you know what, spe specifically about the Arabs, one of the reasons they didn't want to become Muslim is because they had a very good memory of their, their lineage. Our fathers were not Muslim. Their father was not Muslim. Their father was not Muslim. We have a tradition. How can we just leave our tradition and become Muslim? We have a great memory and pride in our tradition. This changes everything. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. وَكَمْ <laughs> قَرِيَةٍ <laughs> so, so now, I want you to remember these concepts. How little you remember referring to these previous nations. 
or these previous legacies of the Quraysh, their, their ancient history. Allah says, you really want to remember history? Let me take you some steps back. Have you forgotten how many towns we've destroyed? By the way, the Arabian Peninsula, specifically the land of Hijaz, when the Arabs used to travel for trade, they would pass by a number of towns that were destroyed. And actually Allah made it a point to highlight those areas that particularly have ruins that the Arabs passed by. The nation of Salih, the nation of you know, Shu'aib, the nation of Hud. These are nations they pass by all the time. They were familiar with those ruins. Allah says, you really want to remember? Why don't you remember that? Why does it not give you a history lesson? How many towns we've destroyed? bayatan. Then our war came at them in the middle of the night. Bayat actually comes from the word bata. And an easy Arabic word from that that all of you might know is bayt. What does bayt mean? Uh, bayt is called house because you sleep at night in it. Bata yabitu means to spend the night. Bata yabitu in Arabic means to spend the night. Guys, did you hear me? What I just said? Bayt means what? Stay at home at night. That's what that means. You have, you have a bait or no? <laughs> right? Bata yabitu baitan, yeah. So, there, so that's, why, that's why you have a home, so you can be there at night. You know, don't show up at 2 in the morning and say, I have a home. That's not a home then. That's not a home. That's Sara Yasiru Sayran, or Sahara, to say, stay outside at night. <laughs> you know? The Arabs have a saying about guys that hang out at night. They say, Asharu min al najm, he hangs out more at night than the stars do. <laughs> anyway, bayatan. Allah says, our war came at them in the middle of the night. Now night is quiet, calm, everybody's sleeping peacefully in bed. Allah didn't just say war came against them. He says, our war came against them. Now imagine, a weapon can hurt you. Allah says, it's not a weapon, it's my weapon. Is my, how, how much difference does it make? All the difference in the world. If Allah just said the attack came against them, it's bad enough. Allah says, our attack came against them. Our war came against them. I spe specifically, I prepared, manufactured the punishment that should come at them. Other places in Quran we learn when the, when the fire or when the, the rocks were coming from the sky, each one of them had the name of their victim on it. Sniper fire. Each one of them knew exactly where it's going to hit and who it's going to hit. Musawwamatan. They had the name inscribed on every rock, Allah says. They were branded. This bullet is for that one. SubhanAllah. Bayatan. Oh, hum qailun. Or in the, they're in the middle of the day taking a nap. Qaidula, it's called in Arabic. To take an afternoon nap. You know? Famakana da'wahum idja ahum ba'suna. And these are the same people who didn't take their religion seriously before, didn't care about anything. When our war came, what was the only thing they were calling out? Illa an qalu inna kunna zalimin. The only thing they were saying at that point is we were the ones that were wrong. We admit, sorry, sorry, sorry. Once the beating began, then they got their act together all of a sudden. That's an awesome ringtone. Awesome. Okay. Can't talk right now. I'm in a lecture. Okay. Allah says, then. Now they're calling and begging. They're saying, we were the ones that were wrong. And Allah says, yeah, the only thing after that that's left is, we will absolutely interrogate the ones to whom messengers were sent. Every single person to whom a messenger was sent will be interrogated. And we will interrogate the messengers too. Those who were sent. The nation to whom they were sent and those who were sent. Now, I told you in the beginning there were two audiences. What were the two audiences? Belie disbelievers who need a warning. Believers who need a what? Reminder. Are we included in those upon whom a messenger was sent? Yeah. Allah will interrogate the disbelievers and He will interrogate the believers and there's only one more group left, the messengers. Allah says, I'll even interrogate the messengers. Did you deliver? Did you do your job? Did you teach properly? He'll ask all of them. We'll see it. We've already seen an example of that before this in the Quran. Isa salam is interrogated. Literally he's interrogated. Did you tell people to worship you? And your mother? Allah says that to him on judgment day. SubhanAllah. And he's in shock. If I said it, you knew. I didn't do it. <laughs> you know, even Isa is being interrogated in this way. So this is a very serious. Now the interrogation will begin. And then we will narrate on to them with thorough knowledge. This is actually irony in the Quran. The Arabs used to take a lot of pride in their history. They used to tell stories about it. 
They used to share with each other, my father did this, and my uncle did this, and he was the best swordsman, he was the best horse rider, etc., etc., etc. Allah says, you want to hear stories? I'll tell you your stories and the stories of your ancestors with thorough knowledge. I will narrate on to you what you were up to. I'll tell you a story that day. You haven't heard a story until you've heard your own story being told by Allah. <laughs> SubhanAllah. And we were not absent. You know, when a criminal is taken to court, he, there's two kinds of lawyers, right? What are the two kinds of lawyers? Prosecution and defense. Prosecution says he's a criminal, he did it, he's the one who robbed the bank, etc., etc. The, the, the defense tries to say, well, where are your witnesses? These witnesses, they were in shock. They don't remember what he looked like. Or the camera is a little blurry, it could have been anyone. And clearly that guy has five more pounds than this guy over here, etc., etc. They can make a case. Also, if they do find out that's the guy, then somebody else comes along and says, yes, I know he committed this crime, he robbed this bank, but you know he's a good person. And he, he must have been desperate, go easy on him. I know what he's really like. There's something else going on behind the scenes. His life story. You know, at the end, to gain, give an easier sentencing, they try to say, I know something you don't know. There's more to this guy than this crime. Allah says, when you come before me, who's going to come and tell me there's more to you? I know your whole story. I'm going to tell you your story with thorough knowledge. I know all your motivations, all your background. What excuses are you going to bring to me? What are you going to say? Oh, you weren't there. There was something. We were never absent. <laughs> we were never absent. And then the scale on that day is going to be true. In other words, how is, it, how is it that that scale will have any misjudgment in it if Allah knew everything? And he's, he's, He himself is telling the whole story of every one of our lives. فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ اللَّهُمَ جَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ Right? Those whose scales become light, or those whose scales become heavy rather, those are the ones that are truly successful. Muflih in Arabic is a little bit different from Faiz. Faiz means successful. Muflih means someone who reaches success after a lot of work. So Allah is saying it's not easy to, skill, to, to fill our scales and make them heavy. It takes work. And those who, people who can do that, they will, they're, going to be, they're going to be attaining or enjoying that success on that day. And by the way, success after you put a lot of work in is sweeter. When you get success without putting a lot of work in, you don't even taste it. You don't. I'll give you a, a silly example, but it'll get the point across. There are some people that are, you know, they live in wealthy situations. Their parents are wealthy, they're well off. Their father buys, father buys the son a bicycle. Forget bicycle, gets him a car. Gets him a car. Gets him a BMW, nice car. Did the kid earn it? No, his wealthy background just, you know, gives him, gets him an M3. And this kid's like, it's, it's a 2008, bro. I wanted a 2011. <laughs> it's lame. I told him I want a blue one. Got me a silver one. That's like... My dad just doesn't get me. And there's another family, and they're not wealthy. They're not wealthy. And this kid, he works at a grocery, he goes to school, then he works at a grocery store, then he delivers newspapers in the morning, and he's saving for like two, three years, and then he buys a 1978 Cutlass Sierra. You seen those things? Serial killers in Virginia drive those things, <laughs> right? He buys that. But he's so happy. He's so, he cleans it every day. And he slows down when he drives, sees his friends. What's up, bro? <laughs> Why? Why is it so much sweeter? Even though it's a piece of junk. It's fine. To him, it's, it's a riot from Jannah. Why? He even gives it a name. You know? He even gives it a name. Don't say anything about Basanti. This is my, you know. <laughs> right? Because he had to work for it. When you work for something, the, the, the joy of it is so much more. It's so, even if it's minuscule, even if it's you know, insignificant. So Allah says when your scales are heavy, every little speck that went into that scale, in Jannah you'll be like, oh man, yeah, yeah. You're going to be looking at your report card and just, subhanAllah. You know, اقرأوا كتابي اهل, read my report card, check this out. 27th of Ramadan, right here. You know, every tear that dropped out of your eye, recorded. You know, every tear. Allah says in another place, nothing goes unappreciated by Allah from a believer. 
whatever valley you cross, every rotation of every wheel you're driving to the convention, every little bit of gas, you use, every second that you do something for Allah counts and counts and counts. The counter is going. And he, he will bring it all back. And he'll tell you, you stopped here. And then you prayed Asr over there. Remember that parking lot you prayed Asr at? And then you wiped the gravel off your forehead. He'll remind you of that. SubhanAllah. He wasn't absent. And so, وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ And as for those whose scales were light, didn't put in any work. And by the way, it's a very interesting analogy. Scales being heavy and scales being light. It's exactly like worldly life. For a believer, worldly life is heavy. And for a disbeliever, worldly life is light. Everything is light, no big deal, bro. Take it easy. Lighten up. You don't they say lighten up? Yeah, you lighten up here, it'll be light over there. It's exactly what it is. You take it heavy here, it's a heavy matter to you here, it'll, your skills will be heavy over there. That's what it boils down to. So these people, they, you know, they took it lightly in this world, so their skills are light. They're the ones who put themselves in loss. They bankrupted themselves. Because of, on account of the wrong they were doing against our ayat. This is actually very beautiful. The conversation is one conversation. It's one conversation. In the beginning, the messenger was disturbed because they don't listen to him. Allah says, no, it's not you. It's my ayat. They don't do a crime against you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They do crime against my revelation. When they ignore you, they're ignoring my revelation. It's a crime against me, not against you. I've sent you. بِبَاكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَظْلِمُونَ وَلَقَدْ مَكَّنَّاكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ We have settled you down in the land. Allah says, even right now, Allah was talking about the Akhirah, right? Scales being heavy, scales being light. But where are we right now? In the earth. And Allah says, it's not like I've given you a bad life here. It's not like you will have Jannah and then good times will come. I've given you a good life here too. I've settled you down. I've given you homes. I've given you comfort. I've given you, you know, beautiful environments, trees, mountains, tasty foods. Inshallah, tomorrow in Surah Al-Rahman, I'll talk about tasty foods. Allah didn't have to give us tasty foods for us to survive. You don't feed your cow and put ketchup on the side. You don't do that. No other creature needs tasty food, but we need to add a little salt, put a little more sugar, add a little this flavor, it could use a little more of that. We didn't need that to survive, you know. And so he settled us in the world. مَكَّنَّاكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ And then, وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا لَكُمْ لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَعَايِشِ And especially for you, we placed in this world means of luxury. Aisha in Arabic comes from Aish and Aisha, they say in Arabic. In Urdu they say, Aish kar rahe we stole it from the Arabs. Come, come, kalimatan sariqna min al Arabiyati. Right? How many words we stole from Arabic? But Aish or Aisha, living well. Allah says, We made for you means on this earth to live well. Allah didn't want us to live in misery here. It's not like in Jannah you'll have all great things. Here you have to live in a crummy place. Here you have to dress poorly. Here you have to be miserable. No, that's not our concept. Actually, a lot of Christian theology suggests this world is like a punishment. This world is like a punishment, you know. And the real, real, real rewards of God are in paradise. That's not the Muslim view. We're told to appreciate this world. How many times Allah takes pride, asks, asks us to look at the sky and how beautiful it is? How many times Allah asks us to look at the mountain, the camel, the tree, and all these things? How come? Because we're supposed to appreciate these things all around us. These are beautiful things around us. So the world in the Muslim's point of view is beautiful. Allah Himself says, I made it beautiful for you. So if Allah made it beautiful and luxurious and nice, then how can we turn around and not appreciate it? Allah is teaching us a very powerful lesson here. You know, part of being a Muslim, an essential part of being a Muslim is to be grateful. To be grateful, you have to appreciate things. Allah wants us to appreciate the world around us. Qalila ma tashkurun, the ayah ends. How little you think? How many of us get into our home and appreciate that we have air conditioning? We have a carpet on the floor. We have a kitchen. We have a sink in the kitchen. And when you turn the faucet, water comes out. We take these things for granted. Are there places in the world there are no faucets? There are no kitchens. There are no floors. There are no carpets. There are no walls. There are no ceilings. There's no such thing as a couch. They haven't seen a couch. You know? There are people that live in those situations too. We should, when we go home, you just look at it and you just appreciate what you have. Ma'ayish. 
And Allah wasn't even talking to us in 2012. Allah is talking to people who live in the desert. Do you think their life is more comfortable than ours? No. What air conditioning do they have in 115 degrees? Allah says, even you're living well. Don't you enjoy dates? Don't you enjoy a nice cool evening looking out at the stars? That Allah says, is, I've hooked you up pretty nicely. And to us, I mean, what's the comparison? So Sahaba saw us today, they'd be like, is this a preview of Jannah or what? You know, Allah did, what, what, are the, what are the things Allah described? Different kinds of drinks in Jannah, different kinds of drinks, all kinds of fruit, servants. What happens in restaurants? Different kinds of drinks, all kinds of fruit, all kinds of flavors of ice cream, artificial waterfall, fountain in the restaurants, right? Everything that was promised. All at this restaurant in like Edison. You know, subhanAllah. We're given so much we don't appreciate. But this is still not the thesis, the point of the surah. We're, we're building up to it. He says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَاكُمْ ثُمَّ صَوَّرْنَاكُمْ Okay, so your life around you is beautiful. Then we created you. We created you. When Allah says we created you, it doesn't just mean, oh, we created move on. It means my creation is something special. So special that Allah Himself takes credit for it. That means when a Muslim believes that Allah created me, then a Muslim does not have low self-esteem. A Muslim does not have low self-worth. I'm worthless. I'm nothing. I'm ugly. I'm too fat. I'm too short. I'm not smart like my brother is. I'm this. I'm that. I'm the other. No. Allah, cre Allah created me. How can I complain about myself? How can I complain about myself? When Allah creates something, all the Muslim does is thank. All the Muslim does is thank. And he didn't just say, خَلَقْنَاكُمْ He says, ثُمَّ صَوَّرْنَاكُمْ Then we molded you, fashioned you, designed you. At-tasmeem, at tasweer We molded you art artistically. Allah takes credit of His creativity in making your face and mine. In creating our bodies, in fashioning our hands. Every single one of us. صَوَّرْنَاكُمْ Then he says, ثُمَّ قُلْنَا لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ جُدُولِ آدَمِ and this is, that's Allah's mastery in creating. Then he took our father, Adam alayhi salam, and he said to the angels, bow down to this creature. Make such that a him. Now we're going into the story of creation. You know the surah began in the beginning, if you remember? Allah said, how little you remember. And the Arabs used to take pride in their ancestry. Allah says, you want to take pride in your ancestry? How about I take you to the beginning of your ancestry, Adam alayhi salam. How little you remember. If you want to talk about your ancestry, let's talk. <laughs> Your ancestry starts with Adam alayhi salam. So let's talk about him. We molded you. We created the first human being. And we honored that human being. So much so that the angels were commanded to do sajda. Illa Iblis. Fasajadu illa Iblis. All of them made sajda. All of them prostrated. With the exception of Iblis. Lam yakun min as He wasn't from those who made sajda. There's a hint in here. The ayah is done. Fasajadu illa Iblis. As kalam intaha. Everybody made sajda except Iblis. Allah adds, he was not from those who would make sajda. What's the point of saying that? He was not from those who made sajda. Allah is teaching us a hint. In Arabic they say the intelligent person can take a hint. They can take a hint. Allah says, you want to be like Iblis? Just don't make sajda. That's what he's saying. He wasn't one that made sajda. Everybody Allah commanded made sajda except Iblis. Iblis refused one sajda. The Muslim who refuses to pray. The Muslim who refuses to pray. Or Asr time's coming and he's in, in the middle of like, you know, modern warfare online. And his team needs him. Right? He's got, this, he's got the strategic location for sniper fire. His team needs him. You know? And his name is Jihad Fi Sabeel Allah or something. Code name. <laughs> right? That guy. And Asr is coming. Oh, bro, I gotta, this, this is, you know, we have to protect lives, you know. <laughs> Subhanallah. How many sajdas we turn away? How many sajdas? You wait, your eye, your eye gets up, one eye opens up, the other eye is still wrestling, right? And you could barely see the alarm clock. And like, ah, it's, it's not that fudger. <laughs> it's fudger, but it's not that fudger. Shut it, let it go. لَمْ يَكُنْ مِنَ قَالَ مَا مَنَعَكَ Now the conversation switches. The conversation so far was about human beings. 
Now the conversation becomes about shaitan. Qala ma mana'aka. Allah says, what forbade you? What stopped you? Allah tasjuda. That you should make sajda. Idh amartuk. At the very second I commanded you. The, co the problem Allah has with Iblis is not you didn't make sajda. That's not the problem according to the Quran. The problem according to the Quran is you did not make sajda at the very second I told you. There's a difference. If you say, What forbid you from making sajda? Done. إِذْ أَمَرْتُكْ إِذْ يَعْنِي مُفَاجَأَةً فَوْرًا مُبَاشَرًا Immediately. How come you didn't make sajda right away? Even if he had taken two seconds to make sajda, that would not have been good enough. It would not have been good enough. In the same surah that Allah describes the hypocrites being in the lowest pit of the hellfire, He says, وَلَا يَأْتُونَ الصَّلَاةَ إِلَّا وَهُمْ كُسَالًا They don't come to salah except that they're lazy. They're lazy when they pray. That's a complaint of Allah for people in the lowest pit of hellfire. We think about that. إِذْ أَمَرْتُكْ قَالَ أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِنْهُ I'm better than him. Obviously, look at him. He's made of dirt. What are his qualifications? Have you seen his resume? There's nothing on it. There's no experience. He just got created. I've been around. I've got an ex extensive experience. How such that to him? Doesn't work. My talk today to you is not about Iblis. So I'm going to go through these, these ayat faster. I have, you know, there's two mistakes. In the story of creation, there are two mistakes. One is the mistake of Iblis. The other is the mistake of our parents. Our parents, both of them. Today's conversation is about the mistake of our parents, alayhim as salam, and what we have to learn from that. What we learn from that. Iblis' is mistake, you hear many khutbahs about it. Many his, his problem was kibr, it was arrogance, it was pride, it was, you know, we've heard many khutbahs about that, and you know about that. But I want to get to the other part. What, how did he get, how did shaitan get to, to our parents to get them to make a mistake? Qala ana khayrun minhu. Khalaqtani min narin wa khalaqtahu min teen. You created me from what? What did he say? You created me from fire. You created him from clay, from dirt, from wet soil. Qala fahbit minha. He said to him, descend from here, get out of here, come down from here. Habita in Arabic is to come down. It means he was in a high place before. It means, and to be in a high place means to be honored. And to come to a low place means that you have been dishonored. Your status is removed. You are you know, give up your ID badge and your card. You no longer have privileges here. Get down. فَمَا يَكُونُ لَكَ أَنْ تَتَكَبَّرَ فِيهَا That it's not becoming of you to show any greatness of your own. To exalt yourself in this place. Did he, was he showing arrogance to Allah or showing arrogance to Adam? Here's the question. He never refused sajda to Allah. He never refused sajda to Allah. Who did he refuse sajda to? Adam. He never said he's better than Allah. All he said is he's better than Adam. We're learning arrogance is not just against Allah. Arrogance is one creation against another creation, even if you're humble to Allah. Even if you're humble to Allah. Some Mufassirun even tell us there is no place left on the earth that Iblis hadn't made sajda to Allah. So if there's one thing he was known for, it was sajda. <laughs> Just can't take anybody in a better position than myself. I should be the one closest to Allah. Why should anybody else get that status? I've earned my stripes. Regardless. فَخْرُجْ إِنَّكَ مِنَ الصَّاغِرِينَ Then get out of here. You are from those who have been made small. To be made small or to be from the small ones in Arabic is to be from the humiliated ones. So there are two statements of humiliation. Descending, being brought down, and to be made small. قَالَ أَنْظِرْنِي إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ Listen to his words carefully. He says, wait for me, give me time. Old English translations say, give me a respite. First time I read that, I was so confused. I was like, why is he spitting twice? Respit? Like, <laughs> what is that? I've never heard that before. Like if you were late for a class assignment, you know, and the teacher says, deadline's over, I'm giving you a zero, do you go to the teacher and say, give me respite? <laughs> or let me give the box anyway, give me respite. <laughs> Until the weekend. <laughs> you don't do that. Just give me more time. Just wait for me. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Just give me a little extra time. Anzidni ila yawmi yubathun until the day that they will be raised again. He already knows about what? Judgment day. Iblis already knows. He's well educated. He already knows. There's no kalam about judgment day yet, but he's already saying the day they will be raised again. 
Because he's smart enough to know. Someone who knows Allah knows that there will be justice. So there will be a day. He can make that conclusion. What are we learning here? That, pe that the, the concept of judgment day is not alien to someone who has knowledge. An intelligent person can figure this out. These things will make sense to him. Even if he's never come across them before. Anyhow, إِلَى يَوْمِ يُبْعَثُونَ قَالَ إِنَّكَ مِنَ الْمُنظَرِينَ Allah said, no doubt about it, you've been made of those who have been given extra time. Allah is waiting on them, holding off on them. You've been given time. فَبِمَا قَالَ فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي He said, because you, he turns to Allah. Look at the arrogance to Allah now. First it was arrogance to a creation. Now it has become arrogance to Allah. فَبِمَا أَغْوَيْتَنِي Because you made me slip. Because you conned me. You tricked me. You misguided me. Aghwa. You did this to me. You ever heard the idea? If Allah really wanted me to be guided, I would have been. Allah is making me do this. I'm not going to the party by myself. This is, a, this is part of Allah's grand plan. If Allah wanted to stop me, what have you put up in my heart? Would have put in my heart? I would have gone to Masjid for Isha. It's Friday night after all. Why am I going the other way? If Allah really wanted, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. People, when they, when they give me that argument, I get really, I'm irked to do something. Like one time this guy came and made this argument, if Allah already knows everything I'm going to do, and Allah controls everything, how is it my fault? I was like, no, it's not your fault at all. You want to say it's Allah's fault? He goes, yeah, obviously. I said, okay. <laughs> he goes, why'd you do that, bro? I was like, it's not my fault, blame God. <laughs> and I was like, you just said Allah does everything. You can't be blamed. So I said, you can't be blamed, but I can be blamed? How does that work? And if you want me to take responsibility, then you have to take responsibility. <laughs> right? We don't have to get philosophical about this. We just have to slap someone. That's it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Subhanallah. This, so he says, you made me slip. And I now, you know, this actually, by the way, is very common in psychology. Sometimes you have sibling rivalries. Anybody suffer from those? Don't raise your hand. It's okay. Dad loves her better. Mom loves her better. She's always favoring her. I always get in trouble because of him. I hate my younger brother. I hate my older brother. Dad's always telling me, why can't you be more like him? I hate that guy. And, and even if he's done nothing wrong to you, your hatred of him grows and grows and grows. And your dislike of her grows and grows and grows. Because the more you see her, the more you're reminded of what you are not. Right? So now you develop this like, any chance I'm gonna get, I'm gonna kick you and like punch you and you know, color your face when you're sleepy. I'm gonna do something to you. you know? And then you get in even more trouble. And then your mother says, what's wrong with you? Oh, you no, I knew you love him more. <laughs> you know? And it just becomes a vicious cycle. Okay? And then you end up in a life of crime and you know, <laughs> all stuff. And your brother becomes a cop and yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyhow, now the reason I'm bringing this up, who does, it, who does it, uh, Iblis blame, blame for his problems? Everything was going fine until who showed up? <clears throat> Adam. Oh, and you made me slip for him? You think he's the favorite? Hmm. I'm gonna. And what does he say, I'm gonna? That straight path of yours that you think they're going to walk on, I'm going to sit there waiting for ambush. I swear, I will sit, I will sit, I will sit. And qa'ada in Arabic is to sit for a long time. Even if nobody shows up, I'll sit there waiting. And I'll stay awake. Waiting, waiting. You know, sometimes people sit and they go to sleep. In qu'ud you can't sleep. In julus you can sleep. So right now this is julus for some of you. <laughs> It's not Qur'ud. He's up and alert, waiting to attack on the straight Siratak al Mustaqim. What does that mean? Young man, what does that mean? My young sister, my young daughters, what does that mean? Some of you. That the moment you start going on this path, that's where he's going to attack. He will not get in your way on the way to the club. He'll say, Go. I got other clients now. This one's already sold. This sale's already been made. I need to come into the masjid. I need to come into the masjid. I need to get inside this guy's head that's sitting over here and get him to send a text message back. That's what I need to do. On the straight path I will come. And he says, your straight path, Siratak al-Mustaqim. 
ثُمَّ Not only will I be waiting for them. When they show up, then I will come at them. I'll attack them. Atayati also means to attack. I swear to it, I will attack them. مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِيهِمْ Right in front of them. From right in front of them. وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ And right behind them. وَعَنْ أَيْمَانِهِمْ وَعَنْ شَمَائِلِهِمْ From their rights and on their lefts. I'll come at them from every angle. There's one angle he didn't mention above. Because revelation comes from above. The weapon against him comes from above. The shield will come from above. The attack is from everywhere else. The attack is from all around us. SubhanAllah. And so he says, all of these directions, وَلَا تَجِدُوا أَكْثَرَهُمْ shakirin." You will discover something. He didn't say, they will be arrogant just like me. He didn't say that. He'll say, you'll discover most of them aren't grateful. Before the story began in the surah, Allah was telling us, I've given you a good life. I've hooked you up. How little you what? How little you think. Way back when, hum before humanity even got started, Iblis came and said, I'm going to make sure they are not what? Grateful. I want to make sure they're not grateful. I'm, I'm, I'll make sure they don't appreciate anything. They're, they're always complaining. It was like, uh, they're always annoyed. Ugh, come on. They're complaining about traffic. They're complaining about the dinner. They're complaining about work. They're complaining about the weather. They're complaining about their friends. They're complaining about the masjid. They're complaining about the imam. They're complaining about Sunday school. They're complaining about their teacher. They will complain, and they will complain, and they will complain. And complaining is the opposite of being grateful. I will just make them a, you know, just constant complainers. La tajidu akhtarahum shakirin. Oh my God, time's already up. Seriously? No way. I, I didn't even start yet. <laughs> the, the juicy parts come. Oh God. Okay. Qala khuruj minha madhuma madhura. He said, "Get out of here, blameworthy, expelled, dahara, to be pushed out." Whoever follows you among them, I will fill hell with them all together. The conversation comes back to Adam. And the, Allah says, now you know where he's, he became your enemy. Here's, your, here's human history's beginning. Adam, settle down. You and your spouse, go ahead. Live in Jannah. Settle down in Jannah. Sukun, sakada means to be calm, relaxed. Chill in Jannah. You don't want to move now. And he says, you know, فَكُلَا مِنْهُ فَكُلَا مِنْ حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا Eat from wherever you like. وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِي شَجَرَةً Don't go near this one tree. That's it. Everything else is open for you. You don't even have to check the label, gelatin or <laughs> nothing. Eat anything you want. It's all good. It's all for you. Just that one tree, there's no fence around it. There's no alarm sign on it. It doesn't say haram. It doesn't say, it's just accessible. It's a nice looking tree too. Just don't go near that one. Everything else is fine. فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ And if you do, you'll be from the wrongdoers. And already wrongdoers have been, who's the wrongdoer already known? Don't be like him. Don't be like him. فَوَسْوَسَ لَهُمَ الشَّيْطَانِ Ah. Then shaitan gave them waswasa. Some people ask the question, if shaitan's already been kicked out, how's he giving them waswasa? We learned something, Allah has given him the ability to make what was a long distance too. His, he's, got, he's got a wireless connection to our, to our chest. He must was a long distance. Hey, do this. Hey, come on the tree. Let me tell you, it's good stuff. In another lecture, I explained what these, why did he, what was the incentive? But here I want you to know Allah describes the agenda of shaitan. I have 10 minutes left for this, 8 minutes. Oh, this is hard. Allah says, Li. shaytanu li. This is called Lama Ta'leel in Arabic. It means the, the Lama of giving a reason. So Allah is saying, Shaitan whispered to both of them for the, this reason. Here's what he wanted them to do. Here's his rationale. If he can get them to do this, he will be successful. What is that? So he can expose to them what was covered up of their bodies, of their ugliness. He wanted them to have their clothes removed. Shaitan's agenda against the human being was not the fruit. Allah does not say the agenda was eat the fruit, eat from the tree. That was on the outside. On the inside, his real motive was get their clothes off. Why am I telling you this? 
multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar industry, an industry that outshines Google, Microsoft, Intel, the entire technology sector put together does not compare with the pornography industry. Does not. One agenda. One, get humanity to remove their clothes. Get, get them to do that. And all of it to sell us to, so we can become followers of shaitan. All of that for this. To this day, to this day, the biggest marketing ploy, the biggest tool in advertising, the hardest thing to escape for my children. I don't want them to see filth, but the billboard is right there. They're trying to, afala yanguruna ila sama. I want them to look at the sky, but to look at the sky, they have to take a glance at that filthy billboard. I want them to be able to, be able to use technology. There's nothing wrong with technology. But how easy is it to just run into a banner? Run into some filth? Even if your children are going to Islamic school, how are you safe from some other child not bringing some filth on his phone? On his PSP? On her PSP? How? Multi-billion dollar, to, to, they, they've done this so that this filth has become as common as oxygen itself. Impossible to escape. This is the battle shaitan is winning. This is the battle. To get human beings to not care about their covering. To lose their shame. And the moment he does this, قَالَ مَا نَحَاكُمَا رَبُّكُمَا Allah Azza wa Jalla immediately says, what forbade you? Or, or he, he is giving further incentive. The only reason he doesn't want you to eat from this tree, and takuna malakain, you guys will become angels. تَكُونَ مِنَ الْخَالِدِينَ You'll get to remain here forever. The memo's already been passed, you're supposed to go to the earth. You want to stay here? You got to eat that. That's the only immigration that you can get. Eat from that tree. I won't dwell on that further. I want to go to this other part. Then shaitan comes to you and says, he comes to both of them, Qasamahuma. He came and swore to both of them, Inni lakuma minan nasihin. I mean well for both of you. I'm telling you, this is for you. I care for you. I know how you feel. I mean well for you. He can be very convincing. He will swear to you. You will feel like this is your own feelings. It's shaitan at work. He's very good. He's very good at convincing. And this is my favorite part of shaitan's tactics. That if we learn about, man, فَدَلَّهُمَا بِغُرُورُ What words? Subhanallah. مَا أَعْجَبَ هَذَا الْكَلَامِ دَلَّهُمَا بِغُرُورُ دَلَّ يُدَلِّي تَدْلِيَ in Arabic actually means to lower a bucket. It comes from دَلْوُن. دَل means a bucket. When you lower a bucket, and also dalla means if you have a bucket, it's got a carrot in it or something, and you're trying to catch an animal. So you've got a rope tied to your bucket, and the animal comes to the bucket, and you pull it a little, and you pull it a little, and you pull it a little, and the animal's slowly coming close to you, and you get him. Does that happen quickly or slowly? Slowly. When you're pulling the water out of the bucket, it happens quickly or slowly? Shaitan got them slowly with deception. It wasn't one waswasa. He came, and he came again. And he came again, and he came again. Little by little, I'll get him closer to the tree. I'll pull him closer one, one step at a time. I'll take my time with them. I got all the time in the world. Because I've got until judgment day to get with these guys. So I'm going to take my time. So shaitan will not come to you, my young brother on campus, one time and say, hey, look at her. Just look, one time, come on, nobody's there. It's not MSA. It's okay. It's just bio, it's lab. She's your lab partner after all. It should be halal here. It's all right. Just look. And you say, no. No, shaitan. Come on. Stop it. I'm your friend, bro. It's not haram. I'm telling you. You can give her da'wah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Da'wah. <laughs> Deen and dunya. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> you know? He'll come. Then he'll come again. Then he'll come again until he gets you. And he will not stop until he gets you. If, you fail, if he fails one time, you say, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم and he runs off, he scrapes off his burn marks and he comes back for more and he says, come on, brother, I'm your friend, why you gotta do that for? Why gotta burn me like that, bro? You know, we'll burn later together. <laughs> <laughs> That's his line. Why you gotta burn me now for? And he'll come and he'll come. فَلَمَّا ذَاقَ الشَّجَرَةَ Then the moment he, they, they both tasted the tree, بَدَتْ لَهُمَا سَوْآتُهُمَا Their clothes were exposed. وَطَفِقَا يَخْصِفَانِ عَلَيْهِمَا مِنْ وَرَقِ الْجَنَّةِ And they started slapping leaves of Jannah, one on top of the other, خَصَفَا To slap on top and on top and on. They were so embarrassed. Not even putting one leaf was not enough. They kept putting on top of the same leaf over and over again. 
They were so humiliated by that. You know what we learned from that? Allah had never taught haya or libas to Adam alayhi salam. It was in the fitrah of the human being. We are already pre-programmed to be shameful creatures. We're already pre-programmed. It's in our nature. And when we lose that nature, that means we're no longer human. That we become animals. And that's what they want you to learn in modern psychology. We're just advanced animals. You know? We're just advanced animals. This idea of clothing is a sociological construct that came later on in society. It has nothing to do with our natural state. Yes, it does, Kafir. We were created with this. We were created with, the sh with shame, with the urge to cover ourselves. With, this is something Allah put inside of us. And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go quickly. I'm going to skip a little bit. I really feel sad that I'm skipping, but I have to share some other stuff with you. Allah Azza wa Jalla now sends Adam where? To the earth. What does he say? He says, Ya Bani Adam, children of Adam. The conversation was about Adam. You will live here, you will die here. You will be brought out of here. But now he says, children of Adam. Who's he talking to now? Hmm. So I just told you a story about your parents, kids. Kids, it's your turn. Children of Adam, listen up. Qad anzalna alaykum libasan. We have revealed, we have sent down clothes for you. You're covering my daughter, my sister, my mother. You know, you're, you're covering my brother. This is something Allah sent down, like He sends water from the sky. He sent the Qur'an from the sky. He said, I sent clothes from the sky for you. Qad anzalna alaykum libasan. Yuwari sawatikuma. It'll cover your shame. It'll cover you. I've sent it so you don't expose yourself. So you don't wear indecent clothing. You know how many times our conversation on campus becomes, are jeans haram? Do you have to wear jalbab? Do you have to wear brothers? Is it so wrong to wear you know, tight jeans, or this clothes, or those clothes, or exposing? Or you know, What's the definition of hijab? What's the definition of this? What does this faqih say? What does that shaykh say? What does this school of thought say? Leave all of that aside for a moment. Let Allah talk. Let Allah tell you. Children of Adam, I sent you clothes so you can cover your shame. Just the love in these words. The love, the concern in these words. Forget the fatwas. Leave the fatwas aside. Just Allah is talking to you and me. With such, and even the, the way the kalam begins. It doesn't say, Ya Yuhan Nas, Ya Bani Adam. <coughs> Children of Adam. That problem, shaitan wanted them to remove their clothes. Guess what? He wants you to remove your clothes. And shaitan will come to you from every direction, remember? Where will he not come from? Above, and Allah says, clothes came from above. Clothes came from, anzalna alaykum. Libasan yuari sawatikum, warishan. And I've given you clothes to cover your shame, and I've given to you, to you as rish. Rish literally means feathers. Rish, they say, you put them as decoration on your arrows. Okay? Qabla rami yurash sahamu the Arab says. Before you shoot, the arrow is decorated. To, dec to decorate. Allah says, I gave you clothes to look nice. I gave you clothes to look good. It's, it's great, perfectly wonderful for you to have fashion statements. It's wonderful. Once the first agenda is met, what is that? Cover your shame. After that, dress nicely. Allah wants you to look nice. Like if, there, inshallah, one day there's going to be like an Islamic fashion company, super halal, and its name is going to be Rish. Inspired by what Allah says. Allah sent to you libas, that'll cover your garment, cover, cover your shame. Two minutes, oh my goodness. What is shame? What libas of taqwa? And the clothing of taqwa. In other words, there's clothing made of cotton and, you know, this material, and then there's a clothing of our personality. The clothes, the garment, because garments are protection, right? And the protection of your character, ذَلِكَ khair. That's better. Look, you can dress halal. You can dress appropriately, but still not have an appropriate character or mannerism. You can still be in interacting with each other in an inappropriate way. So you not just have to wear the libas that is legitimate, you have to wear the libas of taqwa. That's better. ذَلِكَ khair. That is from the miraculous signs of Allah so that all of them hopefully may put an effort to remember. Listen to this and I'll end you. There's so much more but I'll, I'll two more ayat and I'll end. I promise. Ya Bani Adam, children of Adam, la yaftani nannakum shaytan. Man. La yaftani nannakum shaytan. I keep mispronouncing it. Children of Adam, don't allow shaytan to attack you. Kama akhraja abawaykum min al jannati. Just like he got your children, your parents expelled from Jannah. Yanzi'u anhuma libasahuma. He pulled their clothes off of them. Don't let that happen to you. 
He did that to your parents. Yanzi'u anhuma libasahuma liyuriyahuma sawatihima so he can expose their shame to one another, their ugliness to one another. Innahu yarakum huwa wa qabiluhu min haythu la tarawnahum. He sees you, he and his tribe, shaitan, from where you can't even see them. Inna ja'alna shaitan awliya alil ladhina la yu'minun. We have made the shayateen, the devils, we've made them protective friends and guardians for people who don't believe. If you allow your clothing to become shameless, and that becomes acceptable to you, then you have become friends of shaitan. That's what you've become. And so finally, وَإِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً Allah says then whenever they do something shameless, what is the, Allah didn't talk about zina right now. Allah just talked about clothing. But Allah is telling us there's a logical conclusion. Once the clothes come off, then the only thing left is now acts of shamelessness. Once, the fa once your standards of clothing are dropped, then your standards of behavior will drop until fahisha will become normal. It'll just be PG-13. It'll just be a little bit, you know, some suggestive language, some suggestive scenes. Parents mildly cautioned. That's what they're told, right? The ratings industry. He says, no, I promise I'm ending with this. I won't prolong it, inshallah. Whenever they do something shameless, they say, Qalu wajadna alayha aba'ana. We found our ancestors committed to this. This is freedom of expression. This is what our ancestors gave us in the Constitution. That's how we do things. That's how we do weddings in our family. We've been doing weddings like this for generations. Who are you to come and tell us? So they say, we are shameless because that is our tradition. Allah says, what are you talking about? Your tradition began with Adam. What tradition are you talking about? What's wrong with you? What Abba? Your Ab wasn't like this. Your, your father's father wasn't like this. <laughs> he crushed this idea of following ancestry because he started with the original ancestry, Adam alayhi salam. Wallahu amarana bihada qul inna allaha la ya'muru bil fahsha. Tell them, Allah, He does not command to shamelessness. The conversation switches from our clothing, a lack of, lack of regard for clothing, to a conversation about shamelessness and lewdness. May Allah Azza wa protect us against this environment of shamelessness. May Allah Azza wa allow us to raise a generation of shameful, you know, watchful, protective brothers and sisters, young men and young women, that will revive the sense of shame in humanity because this is the one attack he started against humanity. Iblis' attack of shame is not just against Muslims, it's against all of humanity. Because once they lose their humanity, there is nothing else they learn. If al matashat, the Prophet says, if you have no shame left, do whatever you want. So all the doors to all the evil will open once shame is gone. That's what he knows. He knows that. That's why he wants to attack this. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us the preserver preservers of shame and the revivers of shame for all of the world. Barakallahu li wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.